Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone over here. Uh, welcome to Cloud Native Security Con North America. I've been, you know, a moderator for this session. And today we are talking about securing the golden path, adding guardrails for the developers without getting in their way. Uh, is it possible to increase both agility and security? We all know that some organizations are driven to deliver faster and security often get overlooked. So how organizations adopting cloud native best practices balance the growing completely complexity of securing modern applications against? It is something we have been discussing for a long time, but now the industry is feeling the need to, to you know, show the way how secu security and operation teams can collaborate, providing developers with a secure golden path. So in today's session, we will definitely cover, you know, uh, some of those guardrails, policies in the golden paths uh, with a great panelist we have uh, on the call today. And uh, I'll quickly uh, want everyone to introduce yourself. Uh, maybe you can start with Aradhna. Good afternoon all. My name is Aradhna Chetal. I'm Managing Director for Cloud Security at TIAA. I'm also co-chair for TAG Security at CNCF and co-chair several last working group at CSA. Um, and have been participating in a number of other industry initiatives around cloud and cloud native initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Jim. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Jim Baguadia, co-founder and CEO at Nirmata. Nirmata provides Kubernetes policy and governance. And within the CNCF communities, I am a co-chair of the policy working group. I also am a co-chair of the multi-tenancy working group. And I am a maintainer of Kiverno which is the Kubernetes native policy engine. Great, thank you, Jim. Anil? Good afternoon, everyone. Anil Carmel, co-founder and CEO of RegScale. Um, uh, RegScale helps organizations shift to left compliance via an API-centric continuous compliance automation platform. By way of background, um, uh, very active in the Cloud Security Alliance, lead the Washington DC metro area chapter, as well as uh, chair of the uh, co-chair of the application containers and microservices working group and the DevSecOps working groups uh, active in the, those uh, groups as well. Uh, honored to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely, thank you, Anil. Uh, and Liz, hi, my name is Liz Vasquez. Um, I have been working with cloud security um, for at least the last uh, six years, um, and most recently at Barclays, director of security. Um, working with uh, their cloud security program. Uh, before that at HSBC, um, helping to really uh, build up um, their cloud security um, as they were just entering the cloud on uh, multiple platforms, AWS, Google, uh, Microsoft. And, um, and before that at JP Morgan. Um, so yeah, so I've kind of been around the financials, uh, helping them either you know develop the policies, understand what the new security controls and concepts were on cloud versus what the you know traditional security paths were. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. Thank you, Liz. Sure. Uh, thanks, it's a great introduction. Uh, and I quickly introduce myself as well. I'm a global technical leader with working as Savient. I'm a co-chair with Cloud Security Alliance and been also working on CNCF. Uh, been in the industry for 18 years, have been uh, thoroughly, you know, work on cloud security, identity, and, you know, what different disciplines of information security. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to have a great conversation today uh, with uh, our fellow panelists. And to start the question, you know, we know everyone talks about developer experience. So what does that mean and why does it matter? So uh, Liz, why can't you start that? And uh, we can have a you know good conversation on that topic. Uh, definitely. So um, from what I've seen in terms of, you know, being on the security aspect before that, um, I used to be a developer, technical architect myself, right? Mm -hmm. So my, um, my, the beginning of my journey was really, how do I secure my own application? Um, how do I integrate all of the, the various policies um, in terms of code scans, pen testing, um, you know, running my own pen tests and then setting up, um, you know, the environment for, for pen tests against it. Um, you know, so I saw, I saw the way it was done previously 
when it was a lot of ad hoc ad manual doing your security code scans on your machine yourself um, to as we were moving to cloud and as um, not just the developers, but the, um, you know, the, the technology started to allow more of the, you know, like ability to bolt on, right? Ability to automate, ability to um, build into pipelines. So, so it's kind of been a journey that I've seen on, on both ends where the developers obviously have taken on to, um, you know, building pipelines because it facilitates everything on that, on that developer end. I can, I can build and run my environment so much faster um, you know, now with, you know, as Kubernetes started coming into the, to the picture and cloud, the same thing, that mentality to me was very developer friendly. Um, it was a mentality where this is great. I can push out features without having to rebuild a whole application. I can isolate, um, and I easily identify which parts of, of my components of, of, um, of, you know, the aspects of my changes, what was going out. Um, the part that was lagging behind was the security side because the security still still was requiring you to scan your whole application, even though maybe I was only updating, you know, a few components here and there. Those are the aspects where being on the security side, I have seen, we have really been focusing on, right? How do we as security um, now support the fact that, yes, you know, developers are going to, you know, they can build now, now that things are automated, they can build their application four times, five times, 10 times, right? Mm -hmm. um, for each of those times, where are you gonna require a full security scan, right? Um, the, the, the parts that I've seen where, you know, where the developer experience and let's say the security requirements are colliding, it's that, it's, it's is security enabling or are we creating, you know, roadblocks, time blocks, um, you know, I'm scanning thousands of lines of code. I'm telling you now that you have thousands of uh, non-compliant lines of code. Um, what are all those requirements? So, so I'll kind of just, you know, lead it up to that. Like what, where is it at? Where are those challenges at? Um, what's security? And then obviously the security team's working now with the products that are out there saying, guys, this is where we need your help, right? Because this is what, this is what's happening where we can't continue creating these blocks or these slowdowns for the developers. However, we need to ensure that the security is compliant. We need to ensure that developers have a way to easily remediate those bugs, to easily uh, remediate, you know, SEV1 issues um, and, and to still be able to push out all of their features, right? So, so in the last few years, I know a lot of people talk about that. It really is a partnership of security doesn't want to block you, but security, is I think more recently being enabled by products in the industry and so on to help developers rather than hinder them, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, no, I totally agree. Yeah, Anil, you are shaking your head. I think you have something to share, please. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately developers, you know, need the ability to have security, right? Be transparent and compliance be transparent to enable them to do what they do so effectively and do so well, which is develop applications that solve real world business problems, right? So, you know, by using golden paths and having an internal development framework, right? Where you now have, this is the way that we develop applications and you make security and compliance transparent to the developers so that they can focus on building those applications that add value to deliver, deliver and address those issues that do arise in a quick, agile manner and speed the time from development to deployment, right? Really is kind of the, the thesis underpinning building paths, but you know, the piece that should not be ignored, which I think is kind of you know, the, a topic of conversation today is the security of those golden paths. Right, and ensuring that we have secured the golden paths, that we've baked in security and compliance and made it real time, made it continuous and made it complete. Yeah, thank you, uh, Adele. I think uh, you're absolutely right. This is something, it's a continuous delivery process and keeping uh, developer experiences, you know, a, a motivational for the companies to, you know, developers to have developing a good user experience and, 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 and you know, feedback is one of the, greatest power, you know, constantly 
or shaking around in the organization. Uh, Radna, what do you think about your experience on you know on on developers and specifically how how does it impact uh, you know for the customers you're working with from the end user perspective? So my perspective is um, all this technology, cloud or cloud native, everything is to ultimately support business. <laughs> and business changes very quickly. Um, developers have to be able to respond to the changing market needs very quickly. Imagine a payment app, right? There are new features, you have competition, they're coming up with new features. As a developer, I want to provide those features as quickly as possible to my customer base. How yeah. do I do um, So that, plus there are regulatory changes. There are new regulations coming yeah. in all areas, not just security or compliance. There are other regulations that they have to meet. They have to meet visibility needs for the regulators. So. Yeah. The whole concept is that the developers are key. I mean, in 2007, you can go to YouTube and look at Steve Ballmer's presentation on developers, 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 right? Developer cool. experiences, everything. Um, yeah. And how to facilitate that? Obviously, there is a lot of evolution that has happened in the industry and yeah. evolution is still continuing. Um, basically, we want to leverage economies of scale. The common yeah. security controls need to be built into the platform. Right, and then the individual application developers should not have to worry about infrastructure, what server, what host, or what VM do I need to deploy. <laughs> Hence, the serverless architectures in the market today, right? So that they can just develop application functionality and deploy it. Yes, security still has to be built as part of that. So uh, we will talk a little more about <clears throat> what uh, the guardrails and paveways and golden paths mean after that. Absolutely, uh, Jim. Uh, why don't you share your thoughts about the developer experience? Sure. Yeah, and, and being you know a developer myself, um, it, it's interesting to see the evolution just over the last few decades, right? Because, <laughs> like Aradna mentioned, we went you know from a time where bills, which actually you would have to submit a bill in the evening and wait till the next day to get that bill back, right? <laughs> and that was you know the developer experience. But today, within seconds, we're expecting things to be pushed into production in a secure and compliant manner. So mm -hmm. like Aradna was also mentioning, uh, today, of course, every business is a digital business. Businesses that can deliver faster will win. It's that simple, right? And how do you mm -hmm. deliver faster? Well, you need to create the right developer experiences with the right security guardrails in place, policies, compliance, et cetera, but in a manner that's completely transparent to developers um, but, but and empowers them to deliver faster. Um, the other interesting trend we're seeing along with things like Golden Paths is also the rise of platform teams, right? Where, yeah. Who are, their sole purpose is to service developers within an enterprise. Absolutely. I think you're, you're right. This is something uh, as Zaran, I mentioned, and I, I concur with you, Jim, as well. Understanding what customer want and needs is crucial. You know, that's the that's a way to provide a experience and ensuring the code, whatever we are writing, specifically, it's of a high quality. You know, that's uh, the way we are improving our experience. The productivity productivity also increases as a time when team realizes that this is necessary for the project or for the innovation that they need to do in developing software. So yeah, good point. Uh, let's move to the, you know, uh, my second question for the panel over here is, what are the golden paths and how can they help, you know, in, in securing, uh, you know, what, how we can improve that specifically in, in overall realm or what we're talking over here. Uh, Jim, why can't you start with you, you first? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so to me, Quite simply, a golden path is how do you get from zero to production as quickly as possible in a secure, compliant manner, right? And and this, of course, um, is not an easy task or an easy feat. So whether you want to deploy an application or maybe a database service or something else, just having the recipes for this, which can be followed um, and which you know take care of the proper guardrails, but at the same time, allow that flexibility where required is what a golden path is, would be. Awesome. So, uh, in order uh, for the golden path, uh, what can can I say that this could be a series of questions and answers, or could be an offering that what customers looking to solve over here. So, uh, Radha, 
what do you think from your viewpoint or what uh, how how does that golden path help in overall direction that industry is right now going in so um, think think threat landscape today and mm-hmm. an application developer it is practically impossible for a developer to know all the threats and vulnerabilities in every possible language operating system and the whole stack right mm-hmm. there are so many security standards compliance standards i will not be able to focus on my code if i have to worry about all that right mm-hmm. so as platform engineers or security engineers our job is to build these controls and paved paths in the platform itself the tooling in the ci cd pipeline the integration and policy enforcement so when i'm trying to push my code i am automatically stopped if i'm not meeting certain policies mm-hmm. so the in addition to providing guidance to the developers you know training on threats and vulnerabilities so if we build these controls i will not be able to deviate from those pathways and I, my code will still be delivered and will be secure and compliant so the whole point is providing developers those paved paths so they they, they cannot deviate from that like you go hiking there's a paved path right you know where you are going how you're going to reach your summit right similarly um developers need those paved paths in the platform itself so, so that they can deploy code securely and if they are not meeting certain policies they're stuck they, they need to go fix the vulnerabilities or if they are not meeting certain policies um and this has evolved quite a bit over time right how security integration security tools integration and the whole kubernetes um aspect of it right admission controllers um and there's progression being made in the industry on supply chain security right where you're yeah. going further into getting the information about the metadata of the third party software components that you're integrating in your software or code and everything is connected these days um and you're leveraging a lot of open source and third party libraries so how do you make sure your code is still secure so all these are components added together the secure platform the secure cicd pipeline and all the policy enforcement in the pipeline shifts left and also provides a golden path for developers and developer experience improvements and efficiencies thank you i think this is a uh... uh it looks like a very interesting discussion right now anil what trends you are seeing in your like uh, area specifically on the golden pass and how does it impact the overall experience over here yeah i mean you know there's a, there's been a lot of conversation um that that you know both jim and aradna have raised um you know in 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 their points on this particular topic around you know shift left and the complexity of environments um and the need to enable developers to be able to deliver code quickly right instead of waiting for a build to happen overnight instead of worrying about the security and compliance requirements of the code being able to ship code in minutes not days and weeks is in, it, it, it absolutely mission critical to meet the needs of the business now okay. with that said you following golden paths help you make that happen quickly in large complex organizations because you have a recipe for how it should be done leveraging for example an idp an internal development platform right um or you know different paths for you know different different organizations you know with that said those paths need to be extensible right technology and tooling changes at a rapid pace there's new technologies coming in and out of organizations daily right so as this shift left movement takes hold to enable and empower developers to build great software make sure that those golden paths have the right guardrails to employ and enforce security and compliance yet be extensible to allow new technologies to be brought in to help enable and secure the the enterprise absolutely uh, you made a right point about you know how we basically get onboarding or the create and process something which requires a minimal integration suppose you know we are doing a ci cd pipeline uh, integration or a version control system or any kind of a static code analysis that 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 way getting the right set of offering specifically for the customer intent to be done over there is to get an observability capability what is baked in over there so yeah thank you so much for sharing your views uh, liz what about yourself like what trends you are seeing in your area specifically and and 
how you manifest uh, allow those you know specifically in while deploying the applications yeah what um in in terms of a a golden path what we're seeing more and more of in in um what like the the, requ- the ask for for various vendors um mm. even especially in the last couple of years uh has really been the well this is great that you can help me automate the policies but even let's say running these um these security code scans uh let's say every time you push a build to dev or test even mm. at that point it gets burdensome right um which is why the request now has been can we you know uh can you help us scan the code at you know within the IDE environments right can we plug in those policies so that it's visible to the developer so that as a developer is building the code building those module changes they can start seeing and be notified of you know this code right here that you've just written is you know potentially going to violate the following policy and yeah. even sometimes having those you know um those code fixes right the recommendations mm-hmm. right this mm-hmm. this is how you can fix this um because like the, so the challenge that that i would see was as a security team do you do you leverage the okay well you know do you run let's say the these particular scans um like once daily right because because sometimes when it gets plugged in like i said it gets run you know oh we're going to scan it every build well again that gets burdensome on the business because now you're potentially adding you know minutes and and then potentially stopping right a a push to an environment um depending on the errors every single time and like i said developer teams want to be able to build and push to dev let's say multiple times in a day right mm-hmm. um and maybe some of those fixes are actually fixes for you know security requirements um so they're pushing multiple times a day so sometimes even myself i was like you know is it more efficient to be able to leverage and say okay uh these scans will run let's say once every day so the let, let's say the first build to that environment that's one way to approach depending on which which scan it is but i see the um you know um if it's a scan let's say for the the infrastructure for the environment then that you know let's say that makes sense um or that might be every time because you don't change the infrastructure so much so much but when it comes to the code itself I am seeing that the way we can help developers the most is really integrating it during that development cycle during that design cycle right uh, mm-hmm. as we can apply policies to their design as we can apply policies to their development so it's not a surprise to them later on now they you know designed this up this application now they've built all this code and now you're telling me oh you have all the you have a problem in all of these areas right in all of these lines of code i think that's why the let's say the burden on development team has been so great because security has come in further down and i know that security teams have been saying we're going to shift left we're going to shift left the challenges have been how right how what where's the tooling capability you know how do we integrate these policies and so on um that has really been the challenge for security is because a lot of the tooling you know previously has been the oh you can scan it once you get to this environment right you can require it at this step it was still at later steps yeah so. thank you so much les i think uh, you made a very good point about you know uh, how we thinking a shift left and developers normally don't shift left their experience is more security is we talking more from the shift left perspective, perspective. so uh, thanks for sharing your views on that so uh, anil i'll come to you about you know some of the design principles and what what common templates or a unique to your each organization specifically for red scale what do you think uh, are some common templates that you are building for your organization and what your how your customers are helping and taking care of that yeah i mean you know in the in the vein of you know kind of templates and guardrails you know mm-hmm. you there there are you know definitely it comes back to the type of data that you're trying to protect and the type of organization um uh, and its security and compliance requirements for that organization different organizations have different requirements financial institutions for example are beholden to some very stringent regulatory requirements healthcare institutions completely different regulatory requirements right but somewhat analogous right um and then you've got some organizations that have very little regulatory requirements so understanding kind of two things a before you pick a template and say okay we're going to go and put 
the same thing on everything and just assume it's all going to work and everything's going to be great. That's not necessarily true, right? Because every organization is just a little bit different and it should be. Mm -hmm. So first understand what type of data are you entrusted to protect within that application, right? What are you, who are you serving? What kind of data are you trying to trying to protect, right? Whether it's internally or externally. Secondly, what are the security and regulatory requirements that that organization is beholden to, right? Once you have answers to those questions, you can then select from a lexicon of templates that meet those requirements and establish those guardrails for that organization, whether it be NIST 853, whether it be CSA, CCM, whether it be HIPAA, whether it be GDPR, whether, I mean, I'm using regulatory requirements, right? But, you know, whatever they might be, establishing those, you know, what kind of data are we trying to protect? What are the requirements of the organization? And then deciding what templates that I need to go apply helps you then develop applications that are secure and compliant as you move through the pipeline, right? Pushing those ideas into the IDE where it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But then in having the right tools in the pipeline to do those scans, do those both security and compliance checks. So when the code exits the pipeline in the environment, you can validate, yeah, we've shifted left both security and compliance. This code is good to go. Great, absolutely. I think uh, you made a right uh, uh, remark on specifically what, how those common templates be, you know, you know uniquely can uh, benchmark against different uh, security requirement that are coming out from the regulation or from the, uh, you know, from, from the industry specifically. Jim, what do you think about uh, how you, uh, your organization specifically are taking care of, uh, you know, designing those common templates and how it's unique to your organization? Yeah, one interesting trend, you know, of course, with Kubernetes becoming the most popular container orchestration system today, it itself, you know, provides a layer of standardization across, small, you know, any infrastructure, any cloud provider, and gives developers a set of standard interfaces to deploy, and manage their applications. Right? Kubernetes also has been designed to be extensible. So, I mean, even discussing Golden Paths, it's a great example of how a set of complex orchestration scheduling behaviors can be codified, can be offered as a standard but with the right extensibility through its declarative configuration management. And what we see over there is because of that extensibility, uh, Kubernetes policy engines like Kiverno, um, we have over like 200 you know, sample policies in our community library for best practices, for security, for automation, and for other things, right? So this itself creates a good library of these standard templates which really enables developers. So now if, you know, if a developer wants to create a Kubernetes deployment and perhaps they're new to Kubernetes, they don't have to think about all the details. They're told right away in native tools that maybe the pod requires some health checks or probes or other configurations which are best practices in Kubernetes. So that, you know, is, now made possible by these type of digital platforms and systems, which just even five years ago, we didn't have that, those advantages or capabilities. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, moving to the next question uh, about, you know, specifically uh, maybe uh, right now you can take that question. How, how should organization go about securing the golden paths? Uh, what the top security concerns, you know, they should address specifically. I want just kind of get your point from, uh, you know, uh, from the end user perspective. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, obviously, like I've mentioned, um, it's really important to have the platform secured first, right? Um, every enterprise is a multi-cloud enterprise today, mm -hmm. um, by choice or by they've been forced into it because they own the, you know, SaaS um, usage has increased over time as well. And so it's a complex ecosystem of cloud, cloud native, SaaS, and pass services, um, and some of it is managed platforms, some of them you have to manage yourself. So based on the risk tolerance of the organization, it's really important to define what those baseline controls are going to be in all platforms, regardless of who is using what application. <clears throat> and considering cloud and cloud native platforms already provide you capabilities to micro-segment, right? Making sure you're 
you're isolating all your applications and you have controls in the platform itself, um, infrastructure as code when you're deploying, uh, you know, a VPC or something and appropriate security codes. The next is the common security controls, identity and access management. Every application, every component, is every service, every API is gonna need identity and access management, right? Um, <clears throat> then obviously asset management. How are you going to manage all your assets? The cloud platform assets, as well as the application networks that are going to utilize the platform. Uh, detection and response, right? How are you going to detect? There are some cloud native tools available from the cloud providers but they may be insufficient in some cases. You want to layer on additional detection tools, right? Cloud security posture management tools, um, you know, which are context aware that can provide you, you know, the pulse of their platform itself. So that is giving you economies of scale, right? All application services will use common platforms. You can have tools to scan um, CIS benchmarks, your image management flows, et cetera, everything, your repos, you know, making sure your repos are scanned, your appropriate segregation of duties in the repos and all that. And then comes the CICD pipeline. That is common to multiple applications. So you, whatever controls you want to build, common controls, you know, obviously there may be some unique applications which have unique policies, but still you can have your policy repo and um, scanning tools can be integrated. Then you have bug bars, right? You enforce those bug bars through the CICD pipeline. There, there are some pain points still that need to be mitigated in the pipeline uh, for the developers. For example, code scanning tools come up with a lot of vulnerabilities, right? How do you prioritize them? And uh, based on the risk tolerance of your organization, you might need a mapping of, you know, what may be considered high in the industry or what may be considered moderate in the industry in your organization's risk tolerance that is high. So that mapping and then providing developers guidance as to which are the highest criticality vulnerabilities they need to address before they can migrate forward. So these Great. are the common controls that can be built into the platform and the ICD pipeline and forcing all the policies and controls um, as a baseline. And from there, you can continue to enhance, you know, other controls and policies. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Radna. I think uh, uh, you're right. So, uh, Anil, uh, just quick uh, you know, to be mindful about the time over here. Uh, what what, you, what are some of the guardrails, you know, specifically uh, can be uh, implied over here to bridge the security and compliance? What do you think over there? Uh, I'm going to double click on what Aradna said uh, around controls, um, around APIs, having that standard baseline and the mappings, right? So, um, and then weave that all in with a new standard that came out from NIST called Open Security Controls Assessment Language <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. There's this big movement of compliance as code and trying mm -hmm. to establish compliance as code, leveraging a common standard or lexicon. So NIST has kind of taken the lead there um, in collaboration with FedRAMP and created this new machine readable language that allows you to express those common controls across multiple catalogs in a standardized schema and the associated assessments of those controls and the results of those controls and the issues and, and whatnot, right? All in one standard XML or JSON file, right? As opposed to 600 page Word docs that you have to do scaring or pair exercises against, right? Not helpful for anyone. So, so you know, from that standpoint, you know, really the, the rise of the API economy, being able to exchange information between systems, right? Allowing security tools to now talk to compliance tools, right? Leveraging an API centric platform, leveraging a CI CD pipeline. So as code goes through this pipeline, you can establish, here's the controls that matter to me, right? Here's the standard baseline. Here's the mapping of those controls to other standard catalogs and frameworks. Here's the security scans that come in. Take those scans, feed them to your compliance tool, right? In our case, reg scale, but you know, whatever tool you might use, right? And output your documentation as code, OSCAL, right? That allows you to truly shift left security and compliance, leveraging standards like NIST OSCAL, push a button and you can make compliance as code real. Great. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, uh, what do you think about the, from the policies perspective, uh, how, uh, what are the top security concerns and how spe specifically organization can, you know, secure those? 
Yeah, so every survey that's out there about security talks about, you know, misconfigurations being the number one problem, right? So starting with that, addressing that right up front is, is a big win. And policies, digital policies, uh, of course, codified in Kubernetes, um, you know, and enforced at admission time, as well as runtime can help dramatically with that. And then tying in other processes, you know, like, you know, vulnerability management, other things into a Kubernetes and cloud native way of doing things. So, you know, making sure GitOps tooling is available, Git becomes the new system of record and Kubernetes becomes the new system of engagement for developers, operators, and security teams. Great. Uh, thank you so much everyone for, you know, uh, discuss on a very crucial aspect on securing the golden pass and what uh, concerns, challenges, organizations are facing, what can be done, what guardrails can be implied. Uh, thanks everyone for participating. And uh, last 10 minutes, I will have a quick uh, Q&A and, you know, have a follow-up final remark from everyone, uh, uh, from each of the panelists. Uh, so I'll start with Liz, uh, you know, a quick question about, you know, what it means, the golden past for the hybrid and multi-cloud environment. What do you think uh, could be those pathways? Um, in terms of uh, what I think in terms, so for me, uh, what a golden path truly really means, right, what we're trying to build uh, across organizations is, mm -hmm. it, you know, golden means that it's golden for everyone, right? Golden means that, um, like we said, we can enable developers to do their job. Um, we can enable compliance teams to have the visibility of those, um, those standards of how they're being met, of how... Um, of providing uh, metrics. So, so one thing that, that we didn't bring up and, and I, would, I would say needs to be included in that golden path is that observability. So as we're automating and building everything in, I believe that we're um, also then able to build that observability of, you know, I can, I can now prove that this application that's internet facing um, or that this application that I need to prove is NIST compliant, uh, HIPAA compliant, PCI compliant, and so on, I can easily identify those rather than relying on um, applications to self-identify. Yes, I'm an internet application. Yes, I have data that's impacted by GDPR. Yes, I have data that's impacted by PCI. I think that's also one of the benefits of uh, automating, of building templates, of building policies, is that you can then build that observability and see how the policies are being met. See, you know, uh, maybe which policies are, are failing more across the board. And so then security teams can say, you know, why are these failing more? How can we enable uh, developers more? How do we, you know, do we need to provide more templates, right? I know that that's one of the things with that, I don't know, we've worked on in the past is, we, you know, we've said we need to, um, we need to put those templates out there because then developers say, okay, I know how to build a secure, you know, environment, um, you know, that's going to be a Kubernetes environment, that's going to be a serverless environment, that's going to go to this cloud environment and use this cloud product. Um, so, yeah, so I think uh, observability really, really helps us across the board. Thank you so much, uh, Liz. So, uh, I know we have been just low on time, so I will have each one of you 30 seconds to conclude and, you know, provide the, your guidance and, uh, uh, you know, to, to what cloud native leaders can look, or the organization can look into. Aradna, why can't you start with the concluding remark? So everything Anil, Liz, and Jim said is important. Um, in addition, I would like to say automation, automation, automation. All security policies, all controls, all observability has to be automated, no manual pathways. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jim? Yeah, so you know, I, I think what we're starting to see emerge here is, again, you know, leveraging systems like Kubernetes, cloud-native processes like GitOps, and, and really rethinking every, every IT process that we've had in the past around security compliance uh, and moving to the as code model, right? So leveraging best practices of version control, automation, some of these other items. Perfect, thank you, uh, Anil. So I'll, I'll end with an adage. Um, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. So, you know, you really leveraging a golden path in an organization to say, this is where we're going, bringing shift left into your environment and making that real leveraging automation, leveraging technologies and capabilities and best practices 
to enable developers to solve real world problems at the speed of business. That's the future. And if you haven't started, you better take that step today.